You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Please join me on page 80. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Uh, let's read the Jubilante together on page 82. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lambs. Serve the Lord with gladness and come with song. Now the Lord himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his faithfulness he endures from age to age. The psalm for this morning is part of Psalm 119 on page 777. Page 777. And we will read verses 161 through 168. Rulers have persecuted me without a cause. But my heart stands in awe of your word. I am as glad because of your promise, as one who finds great spoils. As for lies, I hate and abhor them, but your law is my right. Seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have they that you love your law. For them there is no stumbling block. I have hoped for your salvation, O Lord, and I have fulfilled your commandments. I have kept your decrees, and I have loved them deeply. For I have kept your commandments and your decrees. For all my ways It started already. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Malachi. My covenant is with, with him. My covenant with him was a covenant of life and well-being, which I gave him. This called for reverences. And he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in integrity and of righteousness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. We will continue by reading together Canticle 12, part 3, and that's on page 80, 89. So the part 3, the people of God and read together. Let the people of God glorify the Lord, praise him, and highly exalt his name. Glorify the Lord, O priests and servants of the Lord. Praise 
reading from John. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more than comes a harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks. 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 We will respond with Canticle 19 on page 94. Together, O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done surpassing human understanding. Your ways are the ways of righteousness and truth, O King of all the ages. Who can fail to do your homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you, because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <coughs> At the, at the time of the Confederate surrender, he was a seven-year-old enslaved child living in Georgia, working in the kitchen of his master's home, wearing an apron with a single button at the neck. That was standard garb for a slave boy uh, at that time. Upon hearing of his liberation, he ran around the house, the apron fluttering behind him like a cape. And he was crying, freedom, freedom, I am free. We can only try to imagine the joy and transforming nature of those words. The nature of the, the words, uh, of those words represented to a child born and raised in slavery with little hope of freedom. This experience would shape his life's calling that child was Henry Beard Delaney. Another black child born under more fortunate circumstances as a free person did not suffer under slavery directly, but he did grow up knowing the evil that was slavery and the continued oppression of his people. That child was Edward Thomas Denby. Today, we recognize these two men as the first and second bishops consecrated in our Episcopal Church. April 14th happens to be their common day of death, but 29 years apart. Henry Beard Delaney was born in 1858 
to, an, to enslaved house servants in St. Mary's, Georgia. After the Civil War, his family moved to Florida to make new, a new life as free uh, people. There, he helped with the family farm and learned bricklaying and carpentry. Delaney was a devout youth raised in the Methodist Church, but suffered a stunning blow to his faith when, as a teenager, he was told he could not participate in communion. He spent the week following this incident in fasting and prayer and experienced a vision wherein he saw 12 men in vestments kneeling in a semicircle around him. He then passed into a church filled with beauty and music. When he was in his early 20s, the priest of the local Episcopal Church funded a scholarship so that he could attend St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina. The school was founded in 1867 to educate newly freed men and women. Now a condition for attendance was joining the Episcopal Church. And this he did with enthusiasm. St. Augustine set up a special course of education so that he could catch up with his classmates. And he became a very good student. Upon graduation in 1885, he remained at St. Augustine's for 13 years, first as a teacher, and then after he was ordained a priest in 1892 as vice principal. While there, in addition to his other duties, he completed several campus building projects as architect and construction worker, truly a man of all work. He also also leveraged his position for the good of those around him. In 1908, he resigned his position at St. Augustine to become Archdeacon for Negro work in the North Carolina Diocese. Delaney still lived on campus with his wife, Nanny. Continued her she continued her teaching position uh, at, the, at the school. In his new position within a segregated diocese, he worked diligently to improve conditions for black people. And on November 21st, 1918, he was consecrated as a suffragan bishop in charge of Negro work in the Diocese of North Carolina. But this work also included work within the Diocese of East Carolina and also South Carolina. Delaney continued his work until six months before his death in 1928. Now a memorial published by the diocese noted his steady rise to a position of eminence in which he had won not only the esteem of his white colleagues throughout the country, but also their love. The memorial further noted his congeniality and uniform gentleness and sweetness of disposition. I wonder if the white men writing that memorial really knew what was going on beneath the surface. Nanny and Delaney had 10 children, including long-lived sisters, Sadie and Bessie, who at over age 100, co-authored the well-regarded autobiographical book, Having Our Say, The Delaney Sisters' First 100 Years, <laughs> uh, that described their life uh, in, Jim, in the Jim Crow South. Now we turn to Edward Thomas Denby, now, he was born in Wilmington, Delaware in 1869 of freeborn parents. Now, in contrast to Delaney, Demby's prominent, predominant theme as a youth was education. And I'll just go briefly through this. Uh, Demby attended the Institute of Colored Youth in Philadelphia, Centenary Bible Institute in Baltimore, Howard University in Washington, D.C., Wilberforce University in Ohio, and actually the University of Chicago. Now from 1894 to 1896, by then ordained as an African Methodist Episcopal Church minister, Demby was Dean of Students at Paul Quinn College near Dallas, Texas. He was confirmed in the Episcopal Church, first ordained a deacon in 1898, and then as a priest the following year. 
between 1899 and 1907, he ministered to parishes in Tennessee, Missouri, Illinois, and Florida. In 1907, he returned to Tennessee to be rector of Emanuel Church in Memphis. And then while at Emanuel, he helped the congregation build its own church, and he also established an industrial school for black students. During this time, he also served as secretary to the Colored Convocations and Archdeacon for Colored Work. In 1918, Demby was consecrated as a suffragan bishop for the Colored Work in the Diocese of Arkansas and the province of the Southwest. Responsibilities included working with black hospitals, schools, and orphanages. Demby worked um, toward full recognition of African Americans within the Episcopal Church, and he did this in the face of lackluster church support with little or no salary and no residence. But by 1934, he had turned his attention to work for his people on a national level, serving on the Forward Movement Commission, the Joint Commission on Negro Work, and the Race Relations Commission. After retirement in 1939, he continued actively serving individual parishes in Kansas, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. And he died in Cleveland in 1957 at age 88. But this is not the end of the story. We can recognize the steadfast work by these men, but their, uh, but their consecrations as suffragan bishops did not signal the end of racism and segregation within Southern Diocese. As I prepared this reflection, I went to Diane's uh, bookcase and pulled two uh, references. The Episcopalians by David Hine and Gardner Sadik Jr. and The History of the Episcopal Church by Robert Pritchard. I wanted to know more of the context of uh, these bishops and the work that they were doing. And I found some interesting points. In the South, the Episcopal Church was, was seen as the church of slave masters, and many freed persons abandoned the Episcopal Church after, uh, after the Civil War to go to other denominations. And if you haven't already, I would uh, highly recommend you watch the recent PBS documentary, The Black Church. It gives some really good insights into that time. Southern dioceses were fully segregated, with Blacks having their own congregations within convocations of colored work, a completely separate structure from, from the white church. Black members and their leadership also had very restricted participation in overall church decision making. The segregation of Black congregations was not totally eliminated until 1954, when the South Carolina diocese dismantled their separate colored convocations. That action came two weeks before the landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, declaring segregation within schools as unconstitutional. Suffragan bishops were assistants to the, the, uh, the diocesan bishop uh, without the right of succession. The idea of bishops of Suffragan emerged as a solution to a thorny problem. How to provide black bishops for the segregated convocations, but not allowing them to have any authority over white men. It would be another 52 years until John Melville Burgess was consecrated as Bishop of the Massachusetts Diocese in 1970. I believe uh, Delaney and Demby remained in the church because they were men of great faith who believed in working within that church structure and that that would make a difference. If not for their steadfast work in the Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Church would be a very different place than it is today. They could not bring down statistics systemic racism within the church, but they were able to provide hope and leadership. Their story reminds us today that we have the power to find ways to work as people of God 
to fight injustice and racism. Now, along with recognizing Edward Thomas in the, and, and revered Delaney, we also give thanks today for our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, who is showing us the way of love. Our own bishop-elect, Paula Clark, who will lead us into the future and for the diversity of our clergy and leadership. Not only are they able to fully participate in the life of our church, but they also serve as an inspiration for those yet to come. Please turn to page 96 and stand and we will read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, to all the world. For only you can live in Lord, keep this Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your safety health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. For the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Loving God, we thank you for the ministries of Edward Thomas Demby and Henry Beard Delaney, bishops of your church who Though limited by segregation, serve faithfully to your honor and glory. Assist us, we pray, to break through the limitations of our own time, that we may minister in obedience to Christ Jesus, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us read together the Collect for the Renewal of Life on page 99. O oh God, the King of Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all upon the stars, incline our hearts to do the law, and guide our feet into the way of peace. That having done your will to cheerfulness during the day, we may when night comes, Rejoice to you, thanks. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
We will continue with a collect for guidance on page 100, reading together. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray that you bestow to God and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may we remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Christ Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one people all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This morning we especially pray for the health and well-being and healing of our Bishop-elect, Paula Clark. We also pray for Prince Philip and Dante Wright. Amen. We will continue with the general, the general thanksgiving on page 101, reading together. Almighty, Almighty God, God, Father of all mercies, we in our unworthy servants give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all who have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you. Peace, everyone. Peace, Crystal. Renee. Peace. peace. Renee, Karen. <laughs> all of you. Lynn. <laughs> Lynn, peace. Take care, everybody. I'll get in touch with you, Karen.